give folks just a minute to join. Can y'all hear my audio okay? Folks who are already here. Hopefully. And I'm trying to see if I'll be able to do screen sharing on this. Looks like I might be able to. Cool, okay. All right, we got about 11 people here. I'm just going to give it like one or two more minutes because I, I know a lot of people express interest in joining this and I want to be able to keep moving forward and not have to double back too much. Uh, let's see. Doesn't look like I'm going to be able to share my screen, which is unfortunate. So I may have to drop some links in the comments for folks to reference. We're going to start promptly at 2.05 though here. So just give me a couple minutes to let some other folks join. And enjoy the sounds of KRS-One. I go live on my phone, so I'm trying to do this with my computer. I was hoping it would offer me some more versatility in terms of, I'd heard there was a screen share function I could do from Facebook Live. Um, unfortunately, I see that option, but it is all grayed out, so I may not be able to share my screen. I will try my best to drop uh, into the comments le links I am referring to. Um, before we get started, um, I'm going to make just sort of a little shameless uh, plug because, you know, I do believe that all of us, myself included, um, you know, if we're putting in labor and work, um, it, it, it's a shame that we live in a capitalist society where folks uh, have to do this, but a lot of us are not being compensated for a lot of our labor right now, so I'm dropping my PayPal and my uh, Cash App in the description and in the um, chat um, happy to do this for free and if you cannot afford uh, to throw me anything I am not mad about that but 
if you can uh, afford to show me a little love I sure would appreciate it um, and help me keep doing things like this um, but I'm not going to mention that again until the very end of this so uh, with that out of the way uh, let's get right into it um, I will be monitoring this chat so if you have questions along the way um, I will try my best to respond to it I've also copied um, a lot of the questions that um, folks had uh, prior to me doing this into a document so I will, I will try to address some of those questions along the way um, if weird things happen with my video or my audio just let me know and I'll try my best to manage technical difficulties as we go so let's get into it so um, uh, for folks that might not know me or my background um, my name is Paul Garner I moved uh, to Memphis Tennessee in 2006 to go to Memphis College of Art I got started um, working as a volunteer with the Mid-South Peace and Justice Center uh, around late 2010-2011 thereabouts um, I think I was like a junior or senior in college I, I guess yeah um, and I really got involved after meeting a whole lot of folks at a meeting where they were talking about uh, police raids that had happened across our city uh, including one at the Mid-South Peace and Justice Center who at the time uh, their offices were at the First Congregational Church at 1000 South Cooper and they were doing a letter writing um, event uh, filing Freedom of Information Act requests with the FBI uh, when the church was surrounded by MPD uh, SWAT cars and unmarked FBI vehicles uh, who then went into the church building uh, up into the offices of, of Mid-South Peace and Justice Center thinking they were the church offices uh, to inform the people there that uh, Mid-South Peace and Justice Center was having a, a protest and they were there for their safety and when it was pointed out to them that they were in fact in the Mid-South Peace and Justice Center offices and not in uh, the church offices uh, they left provided no answers and actually I believe I've got uh, the YouTube video pulled up from that I will share down in the links uh, for reference later and uh, again there were no questions answered about that there were also other activists in town places that were raided uh, who were folks that were just known activists around town and there were really never any explanations um, given about sort of why that took place I'm having trouble finding that video but I know I've got it somewhere right here all right in any case you can find that video on uh, the old Mid-South Peace and Justice Center uh, YouTube page I don't know why it's not popping up I had it a minute ago anyway if anybody else can find that video and post it in the links there is some video of interaction with then executive director uh, Jacob Flowers um, organizing director at the time Brad Watkins uh, kind of confronting some of those officers uh, as they surrounded First Congregational Church with unmarked vehicles. So uh, that was around the time I got involved. Mainly I was involved with, um, and the reason I'm kind of providing this context is because it's helpful to the timeline of CLURB. I got involved mostly volunteering with um, the center's efforts around organizing with people experiencing homelessness under the um, banner of HOPE or Homeless Organizing for Power and Equality. Uh, a group formed um, by people experiencing, formerly and currently experiencing homelessness. Um, I was doing some work at the Occupy uh, Memphis encampment and we had a group of, of folks down there that we worked with to found a homeless caucus. Um, meanwhile, Brad Watkins had been organizing living room conversations at a place called the, the Mana House, which is located, at, I believe, at, oh, let me not get this address wrong, 1268 uh, Jefferson Avenue, I believe. Um, and they do great radical hospitality work, providing um, just a space for people experiencing homelessness and poverty to come and get a meal or um, coffee and fellowship. And they know their folks by name. And uh, it's one of the coolest gigs in town if you're looking for a place to volunteer around uh, homelessness. Uh, in any case, we combined those two groups, the Homeless Caucus from the, um, from the uh, Occupy Memphis encampment and the living room conversations that Brad Watkins was hosting in Midtown um, to kind of form what became uh, sort of Hope uh, 1.0 um, as I'm, I might refer to it and um, kind of fast forward to 2012 um, 
Pope uh, was having regular meetings at the manor house um, in the back backyard there and we would do these in the evening time and um, a couple times you know we had incidents involving police actually several times uh, police used to park their squad cars across the street we'd hear about our members being stopped uh, going to and from the manor house and harassed by police and so we started kind of to develop a focus around making sure that people experiencing homelessness knew what their rights were and we started documenting cases of uh, police harassment. Uh, in 2012, um, I think this was around November, and I think it was right before Thanksgiving, um, some of us were getting ready to leave a HOPE meeting. We were locking up uh, the gates, which I had keys for, and uh, as we were locking up, uh, we had maybe a group of five or six of us kind of gathered there at the gate, locking the doors, um, and as was usual with those weekly meetings, some of our volunteers would uh, give rides to people to wherever they were sleeping for the night. And so that's kind of what the vibe was. We were all kind of saying our goodbyes and, and heading our separate ways. When all of a sudden, uh, two police cars who were headed uh, east on Jefferson, you turned right in front of us and, and pulled up on us and started demanding to know uh, what we were doing on their sidewalk. And although uh, we explained to them, you know, that we have these meetings every week and that we're locking the gate and here's my set of keys, uh, they detained us for over an hour, insinuated that one of our members was a prostitute, uh, would not allow her to sit, um, even though she suffers from uh, physical disabilities and has a lot of PTSD around police officers. Um, it ended up being a very traumatic experience for a lot of our members and uh, several of us were issued a citation that many of you are probably familiar with now, um, having been arrested at recent protests, obstruction of a highway passageway and disorderly conduct, which is the common charge uh, used against people who are protesting uh, by Memphis police and also against people who are experiencing homelessness by Memphis police. Uh, that Those charges are punishable by up to a $50 uh, fine and um, so there you have it. So we were issued these citations. We felt like this was uh, just a, a perfect encapsulation of some of the police harassment issues that we've been dealing with for a long time. Uh, so what we did was the next day, uh, we went down to internal affairs with our whole posse um, and we attempted to file a complaint against the officers that issued those citations and detained and degraded us. Um, we also decided to use this as an opportunity to document and expose some of the barriers around police accountability through Memphis's internal affairs process, uh, which if you've never experienced, good for you because it's, it's awful. Um, so, you know, one of the things I just remember was, you know, we worked with several people experiencing homelessness and uh, not everybody on the street has an ID and one of the things that they said they required for us to file a complaint was an identification. Now we kind of pushed them on that and eventually they said, well, okay, we'll take their complaint anyway, which showed that, that asking for identification in order to file a complaint uh, was completely arbitrary, right? Um, so fast forward just a little bit um, and now we're gonna kind of, kind of start transitioning into uh, some of the history around Memphis United, which was the coalition that really led the push uh, for, for the strengthening club. So also in 2012, if some of you might remember if you were here, um, the uh, Ku Klux Klan um, announced that they were going to be holding a uh, rally in Memphis, Tennessee. And basically then Mayor Wharton and Police Director Tony Armstrong said, uh, just ignore it, you know, uh, we're encouraging Memphians to stay home and remain peaceful. And there was also a group of folks headed into town that wanted to directly confront the Klan. Uh, well, we had intel that, uh, you know, the police were gonna be locking down downtown and have it cordoned off in such a way that you wouldn't even really be able to get uh, close to the Klan folks if you were there trying to protest them. Um, but we also, you know, so we didn't see that as really a helpful uh, thing. And, um, you know, a lot of these out, -town, out of town protesters uh, would be gone tomorrow and we would still have all the same problems that we had uh, before all these uh, racists and white hoods showed up. So we organized an event with a lot of local artists and activists um, that was the first Memphis United Pe People's Conference on Race and, e and Equality. And we held that at Tiger Lanes and had over a thousand attendees and we had conferences and teach-ins on uh, structural and institutional racism, um, artists making music and, and art together. It was a a really cool experience 
And so we had formed under the banner of Memphis United to do that event. Okay, so fast forward again uh, from, from 2012 to 2013, uh, there, we had yet another uh, incident at the Manor House, 1268 Jefferson, again, um, where by this point, as I mentioned, we were documenting complaints of people experiencing homelessness being harassed uh, by police. Uh, we had started a subgroup of Hope called Street Watch, uh, which was aimed at educating people experiencing homelessness um, about their rights at the time. This was kind of in the early days of, of uh, smartphones, so we were giving out little video cameras to our members so they could record interactions with police, things like that, and we would meet about that every week. So this was a Monday evening in 2013. I'm on my way to one of those meetings. I get a call from Pete Gatke, who is uh, one of the folks that runs the Mana House, and he said, well, I'm, I'm sick at home, but I'm getting a call from Ashley Moore, uh, who's one of our ministers at the Mana House, and they're describing uh, that there are police surrounding the Mana House and uh, attempting to enter the property uh, without a warrant and against uh, the wishes of uh, people in charge there at the Manor House. And if, and if you don't know, the Manor House has a pretty strict no-cop policy, and in fact, they don't allow anyone on their property uh, to have weapons. So um, we were already en route to uh, our meeting for Street Watch, and I said, well, let's, let's detour and we'll go check it out. Uh, by the time I got there, it was probably about 4.30, uh, maybe 5 o'clock in the evening, somewhere around there. And what I got, what I saw when I pulled up to the Manor House was, um, a, I don't even know how many squad cars surrounding the property, shutting down Jefferson Avenue, and several police officers on the property of the Manor House. Uh, one of one or two of them were talking to Ashley Moore, who, as I described, is one of the ministers that hosts the Monday night service at Manor House. By the time I had gotten out of my car, uh, and again, early days of smartphones, this was my first smartphone camera and I was attempting to record the interaction. Turns out I hit the record button and hit stop again, so I didn't really get that much. But as I got out of the vehicle and approached the situation, Ashley Moore was being questioned by officers and was then be, being put into the back of the squad car. As it turns out later, uh, we saw a video that Ashley Moore recorded that, that basically shows officers saying, um, pulling up on Ashley saying, you know, I see that you are uh, videotaping, so what we're going to go ahead and do is put you in custody for obstruction of a highway passageway. So I show up, I start questioning the officers for their name, badge number, they wouldn't give it to me. I think one of them said, my badge number is 911 or something like that. Uh, and they told me to, to quit doing what I was doing or I'd, I'd be going to jail for the same thing. And within a couple minutes, I was quickly put in handcuffs and placed in the, in the same squad car with Ashley. Um, and later found out my charges were obstruction of a highway, passageway, and dis disorderly conduct. So, uh, needless to say, uh, we filed internal affairs complaints about that incident as well, right? Uh, which led to, you know, a long drawn out process. Uh, I actually left town a couple days later, but I remember getting a call on a Greyhound bus to Canada uh, from some reporters, and I was basically hearing about another uh, incident that happened downtown at Cape Roche Boutique um, involving a lot of artists. So basically Cape Roche Boutique, Boutique is a black owned uh, boutique on Main Street. And there uh, was a hip hop cypher going on, which if you don't know what a hip hop cypher is, basically it's a lot of folks kind of standing around in a circle, uh, trading off verses, uh, freestyling verses on the spot. I'm gonna walk back inside, just get some background noise. Um, and during that encounter, or during that cipher, uh, several officers showed up um, and decided to try to make the crowd disperse. Uh, and I think maybe somebody said something like, name and registration please on the, on the mic. And all of a sudden police officers started macing people and billy clubbing people. And for those of you out there who are st still friends with Shannon Merritt, who owns 901 Comics, he was one of the arresting officers in that incident. Um, and, I, and that's recorded on video. Um, so in any case, there was an, and police, people who were, were videotaping that incident were, were arrested, similar to what happened to us at the Manor House. So a lot of us filed internal affairs complaints, um, but we were also calling, saying like, where is, you know, why don't we have a policy on filming police uh, in, this, in this city? And at the time, uh, Director 
Tony Armstrong, uh, who some of you might remember uh, from the first 48 um, and some, of, some other things, uh, who I believe now is head of security at St. Jude. Um, he basically said, well, we, we do have a policy. We're working on uh, fixing that policy, yada, yada, yada. We know that was a lie, but uh, basically we all came together under the banner once again of Memphis United that had originally formed to out-organize the Klan in 2012, and we demanded this policy around uh, body cameras. Um, and we got it days later. So in Memphis, Tennessee, because of that pro those protest efforts, we now have a policy that says, uh, you know, you are allowed to film the Memphis Police Department as long as you are not interfering with their ability to do their job. Now, um, as we'll get into in a little bit, uh, that has not stopped the Memphis Police Department from violating its own policy, uh, largely with impunity. But um, so let's go to kind of talking about, before I go any further on the timeline, let's talk a little bit about uh, that internal affairs process and kind of what happened with all that. So um, for any of you who have not filed a complaint with internal affairs, um, you basically, you go in, uh, you, you have to fill out on the spot a your best recollection of the events that took place. And then basically the second step is they bring you back with a detective um, in a room uh, where they interview you, which often feels somewhat like an interrogation in and of itself. Um, and for many, I believe that that can be pretty traumatic because uh, you're essentially, you know, you've just had possibly a traumatic experience with uh, law enforcement officers, and then you are speaking to a uniformed law enforcement officer um, to make that complaint. Uh, and again, you know, one of the things that was, that we pointed out was that they require um, complainants to give identification. Well, we know a lot of people experiencing homelessness do not have identification. We know uh, that people who are undocumented uh, do not have um, city identif uh, or state issued identification, right? So, you know, it's already a, a prohibitive process from the get go. Uh, so, after you complete that interview, um, they eventually bring you back to review the transcript of that interview and you have to sign off on it and they're supposed to interview the officers and their transcripts of that. But at the end of this process, which can take months, you basically get a um, one page letter in the mail saying on such and such date, uh, you filed a complaint with the, um, against such and such officers uh, based on your complaint, we evalu evaluated it for this, these criteria. And these criteria are um, come out of the policy and procedures uh, handbook for MPD which um, according, well, to the best of my knowledge, is still not available on any <coughs> city websites. Um, it's been published by some of us who have obtained it through different means. Um, some people have open rec record requested those policies, but um, you know, as the complainant, I feel like you should be able to um, know how you, what you want your complaint evaluated or at least have that option walking into that process. And, you know, I've been to internal affairs and asked for it and they refused to give it. So if I didn't already know it, I wouldn't have known what to ask my, uh, for my complaint to be evaluated on. So you get this one letter uh, or one page letter in the mail saying such and such date, you filed this complaint against such and such officers. We evaluated it for, you know, um, discourtesy or excessive force or whatever it is that they decide to evaluate it with, which is another problem is that they essentially get to decide what they evaluate your complaint for. And uh, then at the bottom somewhere it says, you know, in this case we found, you know, we found these complaints to be sustained, uh, unsustained, or unsubstantiated. However, even if your complaint is sustained, it does not let you know what, if any, action was taken against those officers. So, um, you know, the, and, and you also do not get a copy of your internal affairs complaint without having to file an open records request and then paying uh, for that, for the copies of that document. I ended up having to pay about $50 for, um, for that, for my internal affairs uh, case at the end. All right. So. Uh, how does that have anything to do with CLERB? Well, at the bottom of that letter that you receive at the, at the end of your internal affairs complaint, it says, if you are not happy with uh, the way your complaint was handled or with the outcome of your complaint, you can appeal it to the Civilian Law Enforcement Review Board. 
So what is the Civilian Law Enforcement, or what actually it said at the time, it said Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board. So what is CLERB? So now we're going to kind of go a little bit back in time. I'm going to try to go over the long, long history of CLERB very briefly before we kind of get into a more recent timeline of events. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, the call for CLERB is nothing new. It goes back to the 50s and 60s uh, when there were a lot of incidents uh, related to um, you know, citizens, uh, civilians, widespread dissatis dissatisfaction with uh, MPD's complaint uh, process after, you know, different events, um, incidents of police violence, you know, on Black and Latinx communities, uh, like the Bloody Christmas of 1951 or the Watts riots. Um, so there were all these different things in the 50s and 60s that uh, sparked a call for um, greater accountability and transparency with regard to law enforcement. And um, it would be, you know, another 20 or 30 years before uh, there was even a, a really organized effort here in Memphis to uh, create um, that review board. So in like September of 1967, the Tennessee Advisory Committee to the United States uh, Commission on Civil Rights urged Memphis lawmakers to create an independent civilian law enforcement review board to address allegations of police brutality and misconduct. Um, and the overall sad state of disrepair between police and communities of color. And that board was never established until way later. Uh, fast forward to, let's see, I mean, we have to kind of go back again to, um, whew, oh God, there's a lot. Uh, I'm just going to fast forward to 1994 um, after um, a, another incident involving um, involving uh, the death of a, a black person here in Memphis, um, there was another effort to, to push for CLERB. And again, people have been pushing for this for years since the 70s. There was a push uh, in the 70s that I, I believe Sweet Willie Wine, or some of you, you might know him, Minister Yahweh, pushed for. Um, but then in 94, uh, CLERB, CLERB was finally uh, created by ordinance of the Memphis City Council after the controversial shooting of a guy named uh, uh, Jesse Bogard, who was a 68-year-old uh, resident of Orange Mound. And, you know, this death sparked controversy and protests across Memphis, and there were renewed calls for a civilian-led uh, review board. Um, and basically, at the time when CLERB was created in 94, there was still a lot of the same pushback that we think of now. So. You know, a lot of people remember um, Mayor Willie Harrington as being a sort of progressive black leader. And, I, you know, I, I know that in many respects to many people he was, um, but he was also one of the main opponents of um, the Civilian Review Board in 1994 having any teeth at all. Um, you know, if you go back and read articles from the early 90s when this was a when this was pushed for, you'll see that the same sort of institutions that we see in opposition now uh, we're in opposition then. So your mayor, uh, members of your city council, and the uh, Memphis Police Department, as well as the Memphis Police uh, Union, were all opposed uh, to CLERB way back in the early 90s. And so um, eventually, uh, it did. we did get an ordinance, although a very diminished and watered down ordinance in 1994, uh, which basically kind of created CLERB as an appellate process where uh, CLERB would be able to review um, complaints of police misconduct once internal affairs was finished with that process. Um, now, if you've looked into police review board best practices around the country, some of the strongest, most effective review boards uh, don't have to wait until after a, an internal affairs complaint is complete. Uh, they can actually review complaints concurrently or simultaneously uh, with internal affairs. And some of that is so that while internal affairs is investigating that complaint, you also have a uh, civilian-led review board that is uh, kind of checking in and, and making sure that uh, things are happening above board and not sort of being brushed under the rug. And um, when we later pushed for a stronger review board, one of the things we tried to get in the ordinance was a concurrent uh, investigative process. All right, so um, 
we're kind of up to 1994 with the creation of the first, again, as it was called at the time, Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board. And I'm sorry, I'm just kind of checking. It's been a while since I've gone over all this stuff. So I just, if I get some stuff wrong or leave it out, charge it to my head and not my heart. Um, sorry. Here we go. All right, so that was 1994. Uh, kind of fast forward to 2008, and this is important. So um, I don't know how many of you folks know who Dwana Johnson is, uh, but Dwana Johnson uh, was a, a trans woman uh, who lived in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, who filed a complaint against the Memphis Police Department. And I believe you can still find this footage. Uh, it's very disturbing footage, but um, she was taken into police custody on some bogus charges and as we saw uh, from video that later surfaced, she was savagely beaten uh, by Memphis Police Department officers uh, inside 201 Poplar. And Janice Fully Love, um, and you know, people always give Janice a hard time, but I will say that in the time that I knew her, she was a strong advocate, and I don't really give a shit what people do in their uh, personal life. Um, when I elect them into office, I, I care about what they do on the record for their people, for their constituents. And uh, Janice, um, in 2008, called for an audit of the internal affairs process and NPD's complaint process. Uh, that, that audit came back to the uh, Memphis City Council in, I believe, 2009. And it was, you know, if you read through that audit report, uh, you really get a sense of, if you read between the lines, that there are all these different flaws within NPD's complaint process and particularly within the internal affairs process. And also that it is revealed that uh, CLURB is basically unable to uh, function as any sort of effective investigative body um, because of, of sort of the limitations, because of the watered down uh, process that was put in place in 1994, right? Um, and also, if you read the language of, and this will come up later, so I'm mentioning it now, but if you read the language of the original ordinance for the uh, Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board passed in 1994, um, the language actually in, kind of indicates that there was also a push uh, to pass a similar uh, joint ordinance on the county side that just never happened, right? Um, and so what you'd see in the, in the 2000, I'm sorry, the 1994 version of that ordinance and even later incarnations of that ordinance is uh, mentions of the county and that'll come up later here. All right, so basically the, um, the audit comes back at, that Janice requested in 2008, um, laying out some of the limitations of CLURB and their powers and uh, there was a call for a resolution. Again, now we're in 2009. So in 2009, it's revealed that CLURB is unable to function as an investigative body. And what is called for is the creation of a committee. So uh, the city council voted to create a, a committee that would be staffed by members of the council, uh, members of the uh, then mayor's administration. I believe that was A.C. Wharton. Um, members of the Memphis Police Department and members of the Police Association, which is the union uh, union that represents law enforcement officers here in Memphis. And unfortunately, well, so the, and the, the goal of that committee was to take the findings based on the audit that had just been done of the internal affairs process and uh, to study that audit, uh, more deeply look into MPD's complaint process and then bring recommendations back to the Memphis City Council uh, for review to pass ordinances, et cetera, that would strengthen the complaint process for civilians. Well, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, that committee never met. Uh, and whose fault is that? Whose responsibility was it to convene that committee? I don't know, you'd have to ask the people who were on the council at the time and the mayor at the time. In any case, uh, Fast forwarding back again to 
2012, uh, 2013, after all these kind of string of complaints had, had come out about uh, police use of force, about police arresting folks who were filming them, uh, people experiencing homelessness being harassed, people uh, who were you know, participating in a, a hip hop cypher as part of the downtown trolley night and were guilty of no other crime than being black uh, and, and doing art um, on the street, which is all what trolley night is supposed to be about, I thought. Um, you know, after all these folks were arrested and filed complaints and we had this protest, um, you know, asking for this body camera policy, we got the body camera policy, but we knew that wasn't enough. And we had, by this time, I think kind of some of us had gotten close to the end of our, um, our process of filing those complaints with internal affairs. And as I mentioned at, at the bottom, it says, if you're not satisfied by the way that your complaint was handled with internal affairs, contact CLERB. And there was a phone number. And so we called that phone number. And we called that phone number and we called that phone number again and we called that phone number again and finally somebody answered from the city's legal department and they said the, the citizens law enforcement what are you talking about so it was just some person in the city's legal department that had no idea what we were talking about so then what we did was we filed an open records request asking for the minutes of uh of the review board uh going back to, to where we sort of estimated that it had quietly been disbanded by the Wharton administration. And as it turns out, um, those minutes stop around 2011. And so from, and again, we're, we're like into 2014 at this point. So for a period between 2011 and 2014, about three and a half years, there were people who were being referred to the police review board, a board that existed only on paper. I'm gonna let that soak in for just a second. So for about three years, if you filed a, a complaint with internal affairs and weren't satisfied with it, you were, were told that you could appeal that decision to the police review board, but no one was answering the phone. And in fact, there, were, there was no one meeting during that time. So the city was in violation of its own ordinance. Uh, Mayor Wharton's administration being the executive branch was in violation of their duties as the executive branch uh, by not supporting and, and convening this review board. So we pointed that out and uh, Mayor Wharton's administration quickly scrambled to uh, reappoint some of the people who had been on the review board in the past and I think they made a couple of new appointments and they said, well, you know, they could meet at any time and, um, but people who had actually been on the review board said, well, that's bullshit. Um, you know, we were, we didn't get any support if you, uh, the late Ralph White even talked about this in some interviews that you can go back and find where he said, you know, we never got any support from the administration. Uh, we would just get these rubber stamped responses, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so what do we do about that? Um, Memphis United as a coalition of a lot of different people, um, I will name a few of those organizations quickly just to give you an idea of how many people worked on this effort. So we had um, ADAPT, uh, Tennessee, that's a, a disability rights organization. We had All Saints Church. We had the Bridge Street newspaper. We had uh, Comunidades Unidas in Una Vaz. Uh, we had Cape Roche, uh Lounge. We had Lemoyne Owen College. We had uh, a group called Loud that was an organization made up of artists. We had the Memphis Five for 15. Uh, we had the Manor House. We had the Memphis Center for Independent Living. We had Memphis Immigration Advocates. We had the Memphis School of Servant uh, Leadership and Mid-South Peace and Justice Center. We had the local NAACP CBU chapter. We had the National Lawyers Guild. We had Pax Christi USA. We had Subliminal Thought. We had Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition and numerous other individuals who were a part of this effort. And what we did was we wrote a resolution empowering us to pick up where that committee that never met that I mentioned earlier left off. So we wrote a resolution basically saying, we for free will go out into every city council district across the city. We will host town halls and forums and we will uh, collect public comment and input around what people wanna see in terms of police accountability and with regard to a uh, review board. And included in that work, we will also research national uh, nationally recognized best practices. And we did that um, in, in many ways, but among them, uh, we connected with a group called the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, or NACOL. And I'm actually gonna drop a copy here of this CLERB report, because I'm about to reference it. 
um, in the comments. All right. And, and basically what we tasked ourselves with doing was doing all this outreach and all this input and collecting all these best practices and putting it together in the form of a report that we would then bring back to the Memphis City Council with recommendations. Now the Memphis City Council at the time voted unanimously to support our resolution because I'm sure they thought we just wouldn't do the work, but we did do the work over a couple of years and I believe, um, uh, you know, it was, I learned a lot. We went all over the city. We were in little tiny churches and big churches and community centers and got all kinds of different input from folks and got a lot of people involved with this effort. So when people say that, you know, oh, we need a task force on this, blah, blah, blah. Well, this shit's been done before, right? Um, and many times. And what we did was we, we formulated this thing that we called the CLERB report, which I just dropped a link in the comments so you can read it for yourself. It also outlines some of the history that I've gone over today. And the CLERB report kind of goes through the history of review boards um, across the nation and here in Memphis, and then points out some of the flaws, some of the findings that we had, et cetera, et cetera. So we brought that back to the council. And then it got real thick. Um, so the next few years was um, us working with our, we worked with our coalition, uh, which included many uh, lawyers and law students and, and lay people from the community, and we drafted an amended ordinance uh, based on the ordinance that was passed in 1994, uh, but we worked to imbue CLERB with as many new powers based on our findings as possible. Um, among them uh, being that you no longer have to, you know, if you, if you bring your complaint to CLERB, uh, you do not have to pay for a copy of your internal affairs report, and you would automatically get a free copy of your uh, internal affairs report because charging people for it is um, extremely cost prohibitive. Um, we also put some time limits on uh, how long um, uh, internal affairs had to comply with requests from uh, the Civilian Law Enforcement Review Board because there was none of that before. Uh, we renamed it from the Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board to the Civilian Law Enforcement Review Board. And you still hear people calling it the Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board. And I hate that shit because it was a very intentional decision to make sure that we were including um, our undocumented uh, friends and family in under protection of that ordinance because not everyone who is affected by uh, police misconduct is a citizen, right? Uh, many of them are not citizens. And so we need to be more intentional about our language when we talk about citizens this, citizens that. Uh, but we're all civilians if we're not law enforcement. So we called it the Civilian Law Enforcement Review Board. Uh, we also tried to initially write in there um, uh, some uh, avenues for, like I mentioned earlier, concurrent investigations so that we would not only uh, be reviewing complaints that had already happened with internal affairs, but that CLEAR would be able to um, investigate them at the same time. I'm actually pulling up a link from that ordinance with some of those new powers here. So I'm dropping that. So this this uh, that I just shared in the um, comments is the amended ordinance that we first worked on. And as you'll see, not all of that stuff made it in there. And um, we also had a process, uh, you know, granting full subpoena power to um, to the review board. Now, why do you need subpoena power with a, a review board? Well. Um, if you've been to any of the CLERB meetings uh, when they didn't have any kind of process for subpoena power, or even some of the more recent ones where a lot of the uh, members didn't so, sort of fully understand uh, their subpoena process, you know, a complainant will come, when you file your complaint with CLERB, you will come before CLERB, uh, you will be sworn in under oath, uh, give an account of what happened um, and what your main complaint is, and um, hopefully by that point, the members of the review board have actually read over your internal affairs file and case. Um, but again, unfortunately, that you know um, internal affairs file is not is, is biased in favor of the police and and the testimony given by the police, and they give most of the testimony and most of the finding of facts comes directly from them. Another reason that we should have concurrent uh, investigations as opposed to being an appellate board, right? Um, and then let's say. Um, it kind of gets to a point where it's just a your word versus the, the record and internal affairs. Well, if there might be additional evidence that is not provided through that internal affairs complaint, or um, if there might be additional testimony 
from an officer that the review board would find helpful in making their, uh, their findings, uh, that's not available to them. The only thing that's available to them is the internal affairs file, uh, now body camera footage uh, from the incident, if it is not censored, and the testimony in real time of the complainant, right? Um, and, you know, one of the other things we actually wrote into that ordinance was making sure that those folks who were, who were filing complaints and trying to appeal them to CLRB within that three-year period where CLRB was not meeting and existed on paper only, we made sure that we put a stipulation saying that those folks are grandfathered in and they can still bring their complaint before CLRB. So it was a, um, I really wish I could share my screen with y'all because I've got some other wild shit that I don't know if I can, that I don't have a link to, but um, anyway, um, where was I? All right, so uh, Clerb, going back to that powers that we imbued uh, Clerb with. So um, a timeline for Clerb, we added some stipulations in there about membership and trying to diversify the membership. Uh, we added in the things around subpoena power and tried to get things in there around concurrent investigation. We also uh, said that they need to have a website and they need to uh, have an up-to-date website that contains all of the information um, that they review and police complaints that come before them, uh, their findings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as some of you might know, they have a website, but uh, it has never been up to date uh, since they actually even finally got it up. And I'm going to drop a link in the comments real quick so that you can see what I'm talking about. All right, so here's the uh, CLRB website coming to you in the comments. Um, and so we outlined what would be included on that website. Again, uh, I don't believe that they are currently in compliance with the ordinance because all of those things are not contained on their website. Uh, but we laid out that process, right? Um, something else that we included in the uh, new ordinance was staff. Um, but prior to this, one of the things that former review board members complained about was they had no support from the administration. They had no support from the council. So we wrote in um, some some fiscal um, requirements there to hire a staff person and an administrator. Uh, and currently, um, to the best of my knowledge, we still have a um, investigator and a administrator that both make well over 50,000 a year. Um, and, you know, uh, I'll let you be the judge of whether that salary has been earned or not. Huh. In any case, um, Kind of brings us up to speed a little bit. So the, the the last push for the review board, it was a process that took several years. And along the way, uh, many of us were smeared as anti-police. Um, our, 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 our character was called into question. Um, I still remember a, and I still have a copy of a PowerPoint presentation uh, given by uh, then, I believe, I don't remember if he was council chair. I don't think he was council chair at the time, but he was, later council chair, Kemp Conrad, and some people don't know how much of a shitbag he is, um, but he is that, um, and I am will say it unashamedly. Um, but at the time, he gave a PowerPoint presentation called CLRB Facts, and this was in 2015, sometime before the final vote on CLRB, and it was basically just a lot of screenshots of my personal Facebook, my SoundCloud, uh, my Instagram, and all in an effort to paint us as anti-police. And I remember one thing that really stood out to me. He said, these people believe that these issues are systemic. Can you believe that? Does that sound like anybody you know today? <clears throat> Donald Trump. Um, so that's Kemp Conrad for you. Um, and anyway, so there were a lot of folks that opposed us. Um, there were several things that happened during the course of that campaign. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, Ceylon, I remember you were there for that. I think you were sitting like right next to me whenever that PowerPoint presentation was being given and I was going, oh no, this is all gonna fall apart because of me. <laughs> um, but it didn't quite fall apart. So there were many delays on the final vote. Um, we also saw um, a lot of trickery from the Wharton administration. We had several versions of the ordinance that um, we had sort of debated back and forth with the council and the mayor's administration and we would agree upon um, a version of that ordinance, and then all of a sudden, uh, Wharton would 
somehow drop a uh, a different version of the ordinance than any of us had seen, and he lied to people about it. And so, you know, people have this fond memory of Wharton now, but uh, he was a big adversary to efforts around police accountability. And I'm posting a story um, from back then from uh, 2015 where he says there will be no major changes. And this, I think Brad Watkins is quoted in that um, as saying, this is why people don't trust the government, and nor should they. Um, so after all these different versions of the ordinance and all this sort of mealy mouthing around from the council and delays and delays and delays on the final vote, and I'm, I'm summarizing a lot here, um, but if y'all remember back in 2015, that was also when uh, Darius Stewart, who was an unarmed 19-year-old um, passenger, um, young black man in the in the passenger seat of a car, uh, was pulled over near the, Chick the Chuck E. Cheese's in, um, in Hickory Hill, and um, Officer Connor Schilling was all by himself, uh, did not follow um, handcuff protocol, and placed him in the back of the squad car. At some point, uh, Darius, we, this, this is unclear, but at some point, according to MPD, uh, he tried to make a break for it from the back of the squad car when the door was open. And again, um, maybe none of this would have happened if uh, they hadn't been scrutinizing the IDs of unarmed passengers in a car during a routine traffic stop. Uh, but what ensued was some form of struggle. Some of it was caught on tape. But what we know happened at the end was that uh, Officer Connor Schilling uh, murdered Darius Stewart, I believe in cold blood, um, and got away with it scot-free. In fact, um, he never faced any um, uh, any repercussions for violation of radio, using his radio correctly or um, handcuff policy. Um, he got a doctor's note claiming that he had post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, the police union, Mike Williams, president, who is also a shitbag, um, uh, basically defended him and to this day officer connor Schilling receives a couple grand a month uh from from memphis taxpayers um every month as a, a stipend for his disability claim and i'll let that sink in again no consequences uh, no charges brought against him by the district attorney amy wyrick and today we are he's living on welfare on, on the taxpayer buck living in south haven mississippi right um, also, what happened was a, a few weeks later, um, a guy named Officer Sean Bolton was shot uh, and killed in the line of duty. And, you know, I don't want to get into all of it, but I saw his Facebook before MPD removed it, and he had some pretty egregious stuff about uh, using excessive force on his Facebook page, but he was painted as a guy who loved books and da 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 da. In any case, they dragged, um, I remember it was one of the final meetings. Um, uh, where we were supposed to have a final vote, I believe in July of 2015. And at the time, uh, District 7 uh, Councilman Berlin Boyd called Armstrong to the podium and said, well, what do you think about um, you know, these efforts? And he cried some crocodile tears and said, well, I don't believe it would be proper to pass uh, any, anything dealing with police accountability, especially when this officer has not even been laid to rest yet. And Sean Bolton was actually scheduled to be buried that same week. So there were some motions introduced to delay uh, the final vote on the ordinance, even though police accountability did not kill Sean Bolton um, and has nothing to do with what we were talking about, really. Um, but what ended up happening was uh, Berlin Boyd introduced a motion to delay not for a week, but and, but for about a couple months until after the November city council elections, which, why would he do that? Why would, if it was just a matter of the officer hadn't been buried, why would he delay it more than a week? Why would he delay it until after the election? Well, um, as many of you know, um, a lot of council people and other elected officials rely on endorsements and money from powerful institutions like the Memphis Police Association the union that represents police officers. Basically, their job is to defend dirty cops. And uh, so we believed at the time, and still do to this day, that that was an effort to shield the council from having to publicly uh, state their position on these issues prior to the election. So anyway, eventually, finally, uh, 
late 2015, uh, we, uh, we finally get this ordinance passed and it's a stronger ordinance, but one of the things that happened at the very last minute at the 11th hour before we got the final vote on CLRB, when we thought we've got all the votes we need here, yada, da, da, da. And if you don't know, uh, if you're trying to get an ordinance passed on the Memphis city council, it takes seven votes to rule the day, seven votes. And you've got your, you've got it. Now it also takes seven votes can fail an ordinance, right? But we thought we had our seven votes in the bag. And here comes uh, city attorney, Alan Wade. Some of you are familiar with him. Some people call him the uh, 14th council member. He's kind of like the fifth beetle. Uh, the sad part is he's unelected and he's just stuck around forever. And another person I do not respect. Um, so he at the 11th hour says, well, you know, there's some question about um, whether or not the city can actually extend direct subpoena power to a board body or committee um, without it coming before a full referendum, which means it would have to be basically put on the ballot and voted on. And at the time, there was even a you know commercial appeal um, study or poll that came out uh, showing that uh, Memphians overwhelmingly supported stronger police accountability, and this was like 2015, right? Um, anyway, we didn't believe that that was true, uh, but enough of the council seemed to at least be playing into that idea that we would have to pass a, a referendum. Well, we didn't want this ordinance to pass without any process for issuing subpoenas. So what we did uh, was, and, and Strickland was a part of this, I actually worked with him at the time uh, to get some of this done, and we laid out a process whereby uh, the council liaison, which every board body and committee of the city council has a liaison appointed to uh, them so that basically like if you're the board of, on parks or if you're the board on uh, public arts or whatever, all of these boards, bodies and commissions have a liaison that's appointed uh, to kind of serve as a go between between the council and that board. So we laid out a process whereby if the review board couldn't have direct subpoena authority, at the very least, they would be able to make a request to the city council through their council liaison, who is appointed to serve the board, not on the board, but serve the board. And the, the council liaison would bring uh, that back to the city council uh, for a vote and for a discussion and vote. And if the entire, if you get those seven votes again on the city council, you need seven votes uh, to pass anything. If those seven votes were secured for a subpoena, then the officer would be issued a subpoena or the Memphis Police Department would be issued a subpoena for, you know, it doesn't have to, you're not just always subpoenaing a person, you might be subpoenaing additional uh, documents or records or, or evidence or whatever it is, but they would issue the subpoena and MPD uh, would have to comply with that. Um, and then the review board, along with those members of council, would hear the testimony, evidence, whatever it is that have been subpoenaed, and then the review board would take that information um, back into their deliberations before making a final decision in the case. Um, and I know this is a lot of, of stuff, y'all, but it's all important context. And this was, I think, one of the reasons that we had such a hard time with this campaign was because there are so many moving parts and so much context um, that it was you know, it's not the sexiest issue, like just ab abolish the police. You're kind of like, oh, I kind of get what that is, but what is this thing with CLRB, right? So so there was a lot of having to double back and explain all this context constantly, and I feel like we're still having to kind of do that. Um, so eventually that ordinance did pass uh, with a process laid out for subpoenas um, with stipulations on uh, on uh, Internal Affairs having to conclude their investigation with a specific framework and provide information to CLRB. Um, i trying to think if there was other, th I know there was other things that we laid out in that ordinance. I'm just trying to keep a million things stacked in my brain. I'm not as good at this as some folks like Brad Watkins who are just encyclopedic minds. Um, but yeah, so we got that ordinance passed around late 2000, I think it was November of 2015. Uh, then there was, you know, I mentioned the, the city council elections. Well, we got some new newly elected officials, right? So we got a new councilman in District 5 named Worth Morgan, who still sits on the council. And one of the first things that he tried to do 
was dig back into the police review board, clearly carrying water for Councilman Kemp Conrad and Reed Hedgepeth and what I've always called the Gang of White on the council. And what he attempted to do was totally shred the subpoena process that we did put in place. And he's made similar statements recently saying that uh, the council should be reviewing these cases, right? Uh, that the council could is in a better position to hear cases of, of misconduct and, and excessive force and da 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 da. Well, uh, what I say to that is bullshit um, because of several reasons. Um, among them, um, if you had any interest in supporting CLURB, you would have showed up at more than one of their meetings. So uh, Worth Morgan was appointed as uh, the council liaison to CLURB, showed up at one of their meetings and never showed up to another meeting again. Instead, came out with his effort to squash the subpoena process. He also said that he was alarmed to find out that he, the council liaison, was a voting member on CLURB. Well, if he'd read the fucking ordinance, he would know that's not true um, because a council liaison is just that. They are a liaison and not a voting member of any board body or commission uh, that is established by the city council. And if you read the actual ordinance, it never says that the council liaison uh, would be a voting member. Um, and if you remember way earlier, I mentioned that back in 1994, this was supposed to be a joint ordinance between the city and the county, and the county never formed a review board at all. So there was still language in the original ordinance, um, and we hoped that we could go to the county um, and try to get a second bite at that apple, and maybe they would jointly create a review board for sheriff's officers. Well, we got so bogged down in having to, to fight to maintain the powers that we had fought tooth and nail to get for CLURB that we never really had the opportunity to go before the county and try to push a review board there. So there was still some language that insinuated county involvement, but didn't really change the functionality of the ordinance. And so what you got um, from, from Worth was, A, we should be the one reviewing complaints, um, you know, which he never showed up to any of the CLURB meetings except one, and then B, we need to remove the subpoena process completely, and C, I can't believe, uh, uh, you know, the voting members, so, so basically you've got some very uh, surface level aesthetic changes that happened in 2016. I actually met with Worth Morgan at the time uh, when this was going on. I sat down with him in an effort to say, maybe he just doesn't understand what's going on. And I laid out the process with him and I met with him. And I said, well, man, I've worked on this thing for like three and a half, four years. If you think I'm going to let you just shred the subpoena process we came up with, you're sadly mistaken. And he said, well, I can be mean too. And I just laughed because, uh, no, he can't. Uh, he, can, he can be an idiot and uh, he can be uh, deceitful, but he's not, I wouldn't characterize him as mean or tough, right? So we challenged him on this. And what ended up happening again was there were some very surface level changes. Now, I also want to point out that if it were true that Worth Morgan or any of the other city council think that they're in a better position to revert, uh, review cases of police misconduct or uh, excessive force or whatever, uh, there is absolutely nothing stopping them now, CLURB or not. And they know that. They're being disingenuous when they say these things. It's an effort to get rid of CLURB. Do you think the city council is ever going to actually start hearing cases of police accountability or police complaints at all? Hell no. Uh, they have no interest in that. <clears throat> but if they get a, rid of CLURB under the auspices that, oh, well, we're going to review these cases, well, who's going to hold them accountable to actually doing that? No one, right? Um, it hadn't happened thus far. And again, does not matter CLURB or not to today, yesterday, a month ago, tomorrow, they could hear any case they want to. And yes, they can directly subpoena officers. They have chosen not to. <sighs> okay, so where are we at? Um, kind of that's the history. That's the that's still a summarized but very long history there. And uh, I'll get into sort of like what have been the problems with CLURB. Um, what have been the problems with CLURB since the sort of reformation of the review board? Uh, well, there have been a lot of them. And I Unfortunately, you know, have, don't have a hard number on the top of my head. I don't want to speak inaccurately about how many cases they've heard since they were uh, sort of given this renewed power. But um, I will say that I went to many, many, many of those meetings and, you know, was often disappointed by um, what I saw as sort of a lack of will. 
from some of the board members who some of them have clearly never even read the ordinance or taken the time to even try to understand like what power they actually had, what new powers they had. Um, many of them, I, I believe, you know, it was clear to me from while they were reviewing the cases that they actually hadn't read the facts of these cases. Uh, sometimes they would drag like two, three people down there on one afternoon to hear a case and you know because some of these cases were particularly egregious or dense um, you know they had you'd have people who had taken off work for the day and they they wouldn't even be heard from that day so that was a big problem was making that process accessible um, again I mentioned that one of the things we wrote into the ordinance was making sure that folks got a copy of their internal affairs file I had a couple of times where some complainants were not uh, told that they could get a, a copy of their internal affairs file for free. So, so there were definitely some maintenance issues uh, with regard to uh, the, the members of the board understanding the process and powers that they had. Um, and also I think some this sort of lack of empathy uh, or understanding about what it meant for some of these people to come forward and have their complaint reviewed for a second time. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things we wrote into the ordinance was that between that period of 2011 and 2014 when the board didn't exist, those folks could now bring their complaints back before CLRB, and many of them did. Um, at the time, I, I did an open records request for everyone who had filed a complaint between 2011 and 2014, and I sent them individual letters letting them know, because I didn't believe the city would do it, you can now bring your case before CLRB and here's my information and here's the information to contact CLRB. Well, there were over 200 of those letters that I sent out and you know there was a probably a, a handful of those folks that I actually heard from and got in touch with. That's how I met Reginald Johnson. Uh, that's how I met Modestine Mack. That's how I met um, Marcus Walker. That's how I met Claudette Taylor. And you know it's if you've never been through a traumatic experience with police, you might not understand, but you know, when you have to kind of go through all this stuff again and again and again, and then just get kind of raked over the coals and interrogated again, it can be re-traumatizing. And I felt like there wasn't a lot of empathy from some of the board members um, with regard to that. Um, other failings of the review board. Okay, as I mentioned, you know, there's a council liaison that's supposed to show up and sort of be responsible to the review board, but they do not have a vote. And I don't know why people misunderstood this, except that they did not read the actual ordinance, uh, but the council liaison was never a voting member of CLRB. Um, when we first reformed it, uh, you know, there was no real support from the council. Worth Morgan, again, showed up at like one meeting and then never came back. About uh, a couple years ago, uh, Councilwoman Jamita Swearingen was appointed as the new uh, council liaison. And Marcus Walker, uh, who had filed a complaint against uh, MPD many years ago, um, he was basically stopped during a routine traffic son stop with his son and his nephew. They were coming home from doing yard work. And during this routine traffic stop where they said that he, the license plate reader said he had outstanding warrants, which he did not. Uh, he was beaten and maced in front of his son and nephew um, during this interaction and the charges against him were then dropped when they realized they had no evidence. And so years later he was finally able to bring this complaint before CLRB and we finally thought, okay, here's an opportunity to test the subpoena process. So we finally got a, a review board that would request a subpoena through their council liaison as laid out in the ordinance. So they requested a subpoena for the officers involved in that case. This was like two years ago. Jamita Swearingen was the appointed council liaison. She was instructed by the review board to bring a request for a subpoena before the Memphis City Council. She did not do that. She is still serving on, on the city council and I wish her constituents would hold her accountable for that. Um, so we've never really seen and, and this is what I say when it's, it's more complicated than just giving CLRB subpoena power because we've actually got a process for them doing that and we've never seen it actually carried out by the people who have the power to do that. So one thing that we could do in the immediate is we could hold these people accountable who are in office now and responsible for doing this to completing that subpoena process 
in the case of Marcus Walker. However, there are some recent developments that kind of complicate this a little bit. Um, and I know this is so long and this is a lot, but I wanted, I've, I've tried to answer as many of these questions individually as possible. And as you can see, it can be exhausting to, to do this many, many times. So I'm trying to do it all at once. Um, so back, let's see, last May, well, so let's just go back. Just last year, uh, 2019, I guess it was, there was a referendum in Nashville. And then referendum in Nashville um, called for creating a police review board in Nashville. And part of the, uh, that referendum gave the Nashville police review board that would be created full subpoena power. Well, the Republicans in the state and house went ape shit about this, right? And they introduced legislation uh, that essentially uh, prevents local municipalities from extending direct subpoena power to um, a police review board. And that went into effect May of 2019. So we now have a state law that limits some of what we can do on the local level. And I'm not 100% sure how that's affected some of the other review boards in the state. Um, one of the models that we looked at as an effective review board when we were doing our research back in 2014 uh, was Knoxville. Uh, Knoxville, um, I believe their police review board was created in like 1992 or 93. And, um, since their inception, they had full unfettered access to internal affairs databases and also full subpoena power. And because I was laid off from Mid-South Peace and Justice Center around June of last year um, and really needed to take some personal space, I have not fully kept up with uh, some of the developments that may have happened in Knoxville because of that. But all in all, what I'm saying is there is now a state law that may prevent us from getting a police review board here locally that has just unfettered direct subpoena power. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that it's a completely ineffective tool uh, or couldn't still be an effective tool in some ways for holding police accountable. Uh, what we need is a, um, a city council that has the political will and the courage uh, to actually put some action behind their words and do what they were supposed to do and and finish issuing the subpoenas. Um, also, as I understand it, and you know, Ricky Floyd or whoever is still on the review board can correct me if I'm wrong, but I know we had several people uh, who grew increasingly frustrated because any time that the police review board has made recommendations uh, to Director Rawlings and uh, Mayor Jim Strickland, they have been rejected outright with a, a short letter basically saying, I trust my police officers. I'm not going to take a second look at this. So remember, the, the mayor appoints the police director, and the police director serves at the behest of the mayor, and the mayor can tell the police director what he wants him to do and how he wants him to respond. The police director is not an elected position. The mayor is, and we should all be mad as hell that this mayor has postured so much around the issue of police accountability without putting any action behind his words. Um, and you know, when he got up recently and gave a press conference saying that we're, we are gonna do better, he acted like this was the first time he'd ever become aware of these issues uh, when he's had years uh, to do any goddamn thing and willfully has not. And in fact, what we know now is during the CLURB campaign, many of us were under surveillance and we didn't find that out fully until uh, a lawsuit that was filed on behalf of many of us by the ACLU um, for the city violating the 1978 Kendrick consent decree and that subsequent lawsuit revealed uh, just how deep some of that surveillance went and you had many of us who basically our only involvement had been advocating for CLURB and other police accountability related issues and that had caught us in this web of invasive police surveillance by the Memphis Police Department, which to this day no one has been held accountable for by the mayor or the city council or anybody. So maybe that's a good place to pause 
and see if you all have any questions. Let me kind of go back and look at um, some of the questions that people had asked prior to this. So some people, uh, Amber Sherman had asked, uh, is Clerk still active, has NPD, our funding for CLIRB back in the budget. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, there are still individuals who are serving on CLIRB, but I don't know when the last, I don't know when the last meeting they had was, and their website is clearly not up to date, which is a violation of city ordinance. So that's a short answer to that. Um, Christina Holford asked if, is Gary Moore's Watch the Watchers doc, documentary available would be a great history lesson. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Gary Moore, who is a local filmmaker and former, former journalist um, here in town, we met him around 2013 or 14, um, and he started kind of chronicling our push for the police review board. And he has a very detailed documentary that probably gets into a lot more of the weeds and details uh, than what I've been able to cover today. And if you reach out to Gary Moore, uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to host a screening of that film. Um, what else? Uh, how have appointments that, how have appointments to the board been handled, say, in the last three to five years? Any comments on board secession, current board member terms, term limits, uh, board training to date? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so the process uh, for appointments to to CLERB is is this um, members and this is not perfect although I'm not sure what the best way uh, to make sure these appointments are fair and representative are but I know this ain't it um, but the mayor uh, appoints members to CLERB you can actually apply on the city website if you're interested in serving on CLERB but that's not a guarantee that you will be appointed uh, so the mayor makes the, the recommendations on appointees uh, to the city council and then the city council votes to approve uh, or whether or not to approve those appointees. Um, I believe it's supposed to be like a 13 member board. I don't, I think they're in violation of city ordinance right now because I think like on their website right now, if you go to the club website, um, it only lists, let's see, about, yeah, if you go to the club website right now, it only lists one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, members. And for some reason, they're still listing Jamita Swear Swearingen as a board member, even though she is not as defined by ordinance. But apparently she's still the club liaison. I wonder when the last time she went to one of those meetings was. Probably been a long time. Um, so she needs to go, in my opinion. Um, what's another question we've got here? Um, let me, let me check y'all's comments. Do y'all have any questions for me at this point? Yeah. Carrie Miller says clerk meetings should all be reported by certified real time court reporters and the transcript be made available to the public within a week. Uh, also videoed with immediate public access. I, I don't see any reason why, uh, they couldn't do that if there was the political will to make that happen. Uh, but again, this is a board that's been neglected in many ways. So even though we did all this work to form this thing by ordinance, um, it's it's clear from review boards all over the country that these efforts are not effective with sort of a, uh, with an, without an active civilian population that is working to make sure that they can continue to be effective. Because if, if it's not a completely independent board, uh, then of course, you know, they're going to be subjected to the, the whims and the obstruction from uh, those in office that are not in favor of police accountability. Uh, looking at a few more questions here. Uh, what can CLERB do? What can they not do? Who appoints board members? I kind of covered that. Uh, how do people get their complaints in front of the board? That's a good question. Uh, how many complaints can be heard in a session? How often do they meet? What is the ordinance that establishes CLERB? What does it say? Why clear board and not just internal affairs? Okay, so those are all good questions. I would say, um, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the appointment process. We talked a little bit about 
uh, what the CLRB's powers are, but how do you how do you get your complaint before CLRB? So as I mentioned, uh, right now uh, CLRB does not have the ability to initiate um, a complaint independent of, of it already being filed with Internal Affairs. So they only can hear complaints that have already been filed with Internal Affairs and have gone through that process and gotten to the other side. So you basically have to go through Internal Affairs in order to get to CLRB, which is a problem. Again, one of the things we tried to push for was concurrent investigations, and I don't know that there's any state law that would prevent us from uh, taking a second bite at that apple. So that could be a place for local advocates to push is concurrent investigations. Uh, I also believe that CLRB should have unfettered access to internal affairs uh, database on complaints uh, so that they can s look for patterns about uh, officers with repeated complaints, um, trends in uh, types of complaints that are being filed, um, those sorts of things. Uh, how often do they meet? Well, when they were meeting uh, about once a month, Unfortunately, um, again, you know, there was a lot of board members that I really um, questioned their commitment because there were so many meetings where a lot of us would all take off. Uh, many people had to take off work. The complainants had to take off work. And they were supposed to be meeting once a month to review complaints. Um, but sometimes we would get there and they wouldn't even have quorum. And quorum, uh, for folks that aren't familiar with that term, Quorum basically means that you have a majority of your membership uh, present uh, and therefore are able to take a vote. Without quorum, you really can't conduct business. You can't vote without a certain amount of your members. So we would get there and sometimes only a handful of the uh, CLRB members would even show up and you know we all wasted time and uh, some folks missed out on uh, work and uh, had to pay for parking and all that shit um, just to find out that they're going to have to come back again. So um, sometimes they would hear like one case per meeting. Uh, there were a few times I think where they had, uh, I know they had two people come in many times and I hated that because oftentimes as I mentioned uh, the facts of, of a case would be so dense that they would not always be able to uh, get to the second complaint and that again means that someone had to take off work and, and make arrangements to be there uh, only to not be heard that month and have to come back again a month later. And there were people who had to come back month after month after month uh, whose cases, uh, in, in some cases like Marcus Walker, uh, were never resolved, right? Um, what else? Let's see, I'm gonna look, uh, I've got somebody from, Shre I've got some folks from outside of uh, Memphis here joining us, uh, Kern Courtney, uh, who's in Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, asks, is there a time limit for a person to file a complaint with CLRB? Um, I'm trying to remember, I, I, I think, I'm trying to remember if we expanded that in the ordinance. I think that there may be like a 30 day window, I think, or maybe it's 90 days. I'm trying to remember, again, charge it to my head, not my heart. I know that there is a time window to file. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, one of the big issues was that we know for about three years there were people being appoint or referred to CLRB um, when it was not in existence and, and when they could not appeal their case. And so one of the things that we did when we passed the amended ordinance in 2015 was uh, write in a clause that basically grandfathered any of those people who filed complaints within that three-year period would still be able to bring their case before CLRB. But I think that's definitely an important consideration. Um, to make if you're working on efforts around your your own local ordinances, um, what is the time window there to file a complaint? And but again, I think that's one of the reasons that we need concurrent investigations is so that you know if you file with Internal Affairs, CLRB is looking at it too. Or you know better yet, a civilian might have an option to file with a review board uh, initially instead of having to go down and deal with officers who are often dressed the same and trained the same as. Uh, the officers that they just had a bad experience with and are now filing a complaint. Um, I've got a few more questions here in the doc and I'm not going to prolong this too much. Um, what determines how much power CLRB has? I've had many times, I've heard many times that CLRB is, CLRB is toothless, uh, but why is that and how might we give it teeth? So we've kind of been touching on that uh, throughout this. Um, you know, we 
did some actions around the idea of Claire being toothless. And, and, you know, I think that subpoena process is, is part of it. Um, having full unfettered access to internal affairs is important um, because we need an independent body to investigate these things. So the problem with it just being internal affairs is that MPD controls, inter it's MPD's process. And prior to us uh, bringing back CLURB, MPD's internal affairs process is the only process for seeking accountability against an officer if, um, if you've had a bad experience or a complaint of any type. Uh, and, you know, policing yourself doesn't make a, any sense. And I think most of us know that to be common knowledge now. It's taken many years for that narrative to become a little more accepted. But uh, police are not capable of policing themselves, as we've seen over and over and over. So the only process for, for filing a complaint and seeking recourse is either having enough money and resources to hire an expensive attorney to represent you, A, uh, that leaves out the majority of Memphis's uh, population who are low income and cannot afford an attorney. And the only time an attorney is probably going to step in for free and do that case pro bono is if uh, the result of that bad incident with police is, is particularly egregious, such as being critically injured or killed by the police. That's oftentimes the only time an attorney will get involved pro bono is because that's the only time there's actually going to be uh, any kind of monetary um, uh, interest for that attorney, right? And uh, Bonnie in the comments just said, Gary Moore, uh, more media strategies on Facebook offers 10 day free link to who will watch the watchers. So if you message citizens media resource or the who will watch the watchers page, you can um, get a, a link to watch the documentary that he made about this whole uh, effort over many years on, and you can watch that. It's, it's long and it's got a lot of information. Um, a couple more questions. Um, where are places around the country where similar boards have and really been successful as roadmaps for what could be possible here? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And, you know, again, I'm, I haven't been doing this work professionally for a little around a year now. Um, so I may not be up to date on all the latest, but one resource to, to definitely check out for effective, uh, police review boards is again, the Yes. Okay. And Kern's kind of asking a similar question here. Uh, what are some best resources? Um, so one of the places that we really started was looking to see if there were other effective review boards in, uh, in our state. And I used to spend a lot of time on the phone with Avis Reed, who was at the time the uh, coordinator for the uh, review board in Knoxville, where, as I mentioned, they've, since their inception in the early 90s, had full subpoena power. And uh, unfettered access to internal affairs uh, databases. Um, another one I'm about to drop in the comments is uh, NACOL, uh, which is an acronym for the National Agency uh, for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. Uh, they're basically kind of a conglomerate of um, review boards all over the um, all over the country. I'm not sure that our review board has ever officially certified. Uh, with NACOL, that I may, I may be wrong on that. I know they link to NACOL on our local CLURB website. Um, and I'm not sure who the president is now, but at the time uh, there was a guy named Brian Butchner, uh, who was the president of NACOL out of um, California. And he was very helpful to me in terms of just spending time on the phone with me, pointing me in the right direction, putting me in touch with uh, people like Avis Reed in Knoxville. Um, representatives of not call across the nation to talk about what best practices were. Um, so not is a great resource if you're trying to get your own review board started, or if you're working on efforts to strengthen sort of a toothless review board, uh, they're a good place to start in terms of best practice. He even wrote a letter on our behalf to the Memphis city council, uh, speaking to the need for review boards, which, um, as some of y'all might remember, under Obama was one of the recommendations of his 21st century uh, task force on, on policing uh, was strong review boards in cities. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Um, Nate asks, uh, who on the city, on the current city council would support a stronger CLURB, aka how many people do we need 
to get elected uh, to this council of strength and clerk. Well, I think you possibly have the votes now. I think um, it's kind of a matter of taking them to task and um, making sure that some of these newly elected council people um, are not just sort of doing window dressing, cursory resolutions and things like that. Um, I know this push to adopt the eight that can't wait is um, something that uh, some of the council people have started pushing, but some of the language I saw on some of those resolutions are non-binding uh, recommendations to Strickland to do things uh, when we know that there are changes that could be made via ordinance, which basically is a change of city law, right? Um, that would maybe be more effective, uh, such as um, stronger ordinance supporting CLERB. Now, the thing that you, you would have to watch out for is some of what we saw with Worth Morgan uh, back in 2016 and again in 2019, where he tried to gut subpoena power completely under the uh, false concern that the review board wasn't effective enough as if he gives a damn about holding officers accountable. As I mentioned before, there is absolutely nothing from stopping this current city council uh, from investigating any form of police complaint that they want to. If they wanted to hear an individual uh, case, if they, if they found a case that they thought was egregious and they wanted to subpoena those officers, uh, they could hold court on that uh, this week if they wanted to. Uh, they could also, as I've encouraged many of members of the council to do, uh, call for an audit, much as um, Janice Fully Love did in 2008 with uh, her audit of MPD's complaint process, including internal affairs. And I think one thing that we uh, could push our city councilors to do is, is an audit of MPD's internal affairs complaint process, but also uh, let's audit their database and look at how many officers we currently have serving on the force uh, with multiple complaints filed against them or mul multiple um, allegations brought against them and looking at patterns of uh, what those allegations are for um, and reviewing the, the facts of those cases um, and if it's truly a matter of bad apples, I'm sure MPD would be happy uh, to comply with that. Um, although I continue to believe that these issues are systemic. Um, and you saw even recently with, with uh, some of these council members um, cursory asks around stronger policy on use of force and uh, banning chokeholds and not firing into vehicles. Uh, the Strickland administration just recently posted a response to those basically saying, oh, well, we already have all that in place, so I guess everything's fine, right? Um, nothing to worry about here. We, we're already doing everything perfectly. Um, but in terms of like which, which council people might be opponents and which council people might be for it, um, I'm not familiar personally with every single member of the, of the council these days. I haven't sat down in meetings with a lot of them. Um, I know that we've got some strong progressive voices that were recently elected. I think Michael and Easter Thomas, um, uh, chief among them, J.B. Smiley Jr., um, possibly Rhonda Logan would be an ally. Um, I think Jeff Warren, despite some goofy things he said, I think could be moved on the issue. So that gives you four. Uh, who am I leaving out? If you could push uh, Martavius Jones, that gives you five. Um, if you could push um, two more people, that gives you the seven that you would need to pass any ordinance. So remember that you don't have to get everybody on the city council. You just got to get those seven votes. And that's, you know, check your own local um, makeup of your council. Uh, may be different in, in your city, but here in Memphis, it's seven votes to rule the day. So all we need is seven people that will, will come along. Uh, I always say go for eight just to be on the safe side, but, you know. Um, any other questions in the chat? I think I've got maybe one or two more here. I think that's all. I think I've covered most of the questions that people asked uh, prior to this in the Facebook. Um, and I would also say I'm going to post this link real quick. Um, as I mentioned, I, I no longer work for Mid South Peace and Justice Center, um, although the website still has quite a lot of documentation on it. So if you're interested in digging into more of the details around our efforts around CLURB, I used to write weekly newsletters that tried to break everything down as much as possible and provide as much detail. Um, I just shared a link in the comments here um, that's basically as if you, if you had gone to the Mid-South Peace and Justice Center website 
and searched for CLURB in our old newsletters. And so what this should give you is um, years worth of um, documentation and research and, and just kind of all the, all the bullshit we went through uh, to even get what we have today passed. So I'm including that in the comments. Um, there's also some, some videos on YouTube uh, that we put together back in the day that kind of tells some of the complainant stories and, and like what some of these people actually had to go through uh, just to get their complaints heard. Um, before we hop off, uh, are, there, are there any final questions here today, something that you were really hoping I would address but, but maybe did not or maybe that you missed? I'm going to give just a minute here in the comments. Um, and like I said, you know, some of the issues that we have is not really with the ordinance not giving our review board enough power, but with people not being familiar enough with the powers laid out in that ordinance, which you can find a, a current copy of that on the CLURB website under, um, I believe it's under board information and documents. Yes, it is. And I'm going to post a link to that here as well in the comments. So you can find the current CLURB ordinance as amended um, right here on this page. And, you know, I, I think, you know, where do we start? Uh, we, need to, we need to understand, you know, what are the things that we're asking for, which, I, again, I, I've pointed to. Um, a deeper examination of internal affairs and all the all the problems with internal affairs, um, and also understanding what's within the CLURB ordinance and holding uh, the current mayor's administration and city council accountable to actually support and enforce uh, the doctrine that they or the um, ordinance that that is law in this city, right? Um, that that they are not compliant in compliance with. Um, and I'm also not saying that just because we get CLURB or uh, a more streamlined, accessible internal affairs process that this is going to fix uh, the structural racism within uh, institutions of police or uh, that it's going to be a silver bullet fix for police accountability. Um, but I do think that these are some uh, simple, concrete places to start um, to, to foster a um, more accepted and mainstreamed um, embrace of, of these police accountability values that I think most of us believe in. Um, so if there, if there aren't any more questions, uh, I just want to say I, I appreciate uh, each and every one of you who's tuning in, uh, trying to kind of learn more about what past efforts have looked like and maybe apply them here in Memphis or in your own city. Um, one last shameless promotion, I'm posting my PayPal and my Cash App in the comments. Um, I, you know, put this out here for free, but, um, you know, if you can afford to show me a little love, uh, I sure appreciate it, and it helps me kind of just keep showing up, you know. Um, so one, I still see a few people on the live chat. Any other questions that we want to get to today before I sign off? All right. Well. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, I see some people are just now logging in. Well, uh, we've been on here for a little over an hour, uh, so there's a lot to kind of go back and wade through. And, and um, you know, I may try to do this again sometime uh, once I my vocal cords recover from, from this go round. But um, I appreciate all of you for, for tuning in. I appreciate um, all these folks who are showing up all over our country and all over our planet right now demanding uh, justice and real systemic change, um, an end to uh, the gross and egregious racism uh, that is present within not just law enforcement, but so many of our uh, American institutions. And it's a beautiful thing to see so many new people involved, um, so many people showing up and, and trying to listen and learn and share their experiences, share their talents. Um, and so maybe CLURB isn't the campaign that, that you yourself want to work on, but there are so many other ways to get involved. I know uh, here locally uh, you can support 
uh, the efforts of folks who are who are engaging in direct action on the street by supporting uh, the uh, um, Black Lives Matter bail fund. Um, I'll put a link here for that. Uh, slash BLM. Um, there are folks that are doing mutual aid projects. There are folks that are uh, coordinating actions um, in solidarity with um, other folks are working to protect more vulnerable people who are out there protesting. So there's a lot of ways to show up. Um, I'm a I'm a big believer that a direct action should have some sort of ask attached to it. And so maybe some of the things we discussed here today um, will be things that that you find yourself um, uplifting as an ask in your local community. But oh, and I totally misspelled that <laughs> link. Let me fix that real quick. All right. Well, again, um, we've been over, we've been here for a little over an hour, so I'm gonna sign off and have a cold beer and try to enjoy the rest of my uh, afternoon. Um, you can also, oh, if you're looking for ways to get involved, um, you can also check out the um, Memphis Activism Calendar. If you go to Google and just type in Memphis Activism Calendar, uh, they keep a, I think they try to keep a pretty comprehensive calendar of events and you can sign up for text alerts there about things going on in the city. Um, maybe you're not in Memphis and maybe you want, maybe your way of contributing would be maybe setting something that up for your, uh, like that for your own local community. But I just want to stress that there are um, so many ways uh, to get involved and uh, they're not limited to boots on the ground in the street, although that is an important part, but also research, um, you know, working to develop and draft ordinances for change in your own local community, um, contacting your elected officials, um, making music and art um, to, to re-envision our society and deconstruct the one that is currently in place. There's so many ways to show up, so I just encourage you all to continue to do that. Um, peace. Oh yeah, and I'm gonna play my, my uh, Clurb Your Enthusiasm music now. Oh, <laughs>